someone asked me, what's the vision? What are you praying for? What's keeping your heart alive? I said, it's not necessarily a vision, but a person, Jesus of Nazareth. The salvation that's only found in him, his way of life, his being, his mission to the world. I wanna come alive in that. I want that, no, I need that for my friends and my family and my city. But the bigger question is, how do we get that? Can his way of life really be our way of life? I think it starts with hunger, a God-sized, unyielding spiritual desire that wants more of him in our lives and more of our lives in him. To wake up every day and tear apart from apathy, indifference, distractions, and stresses, and step into the reality that we are in a relationship with the living God. And not only does he call us his friend, he invites us to be a part of his story. I think it looks like holiness, not the kind that's too good for you, but the kind of holiness that's had its fill of living the pattern of the world and is still left wanting more life and love to its fullest. So suddenly lesser loves seem like sterile microwave dinners in comparison to the banquet feast that Christ is already offering us. It's the kind of holiness that won't stop chasing after all that God has for us. And it refuses to settle for less because holiness is the fuel on the fire of hunger. I think it looks like a higher kingdom. The one that Jesus began and the one that we're living in now and the one that will resound throughout all eternity. It's men and women whose allegiance to King Jesus and his kingdom is higher than their allegiance to their careers higher than their allegiance to their comforts, higher than their allegiance to their smaller kingdoms. It's sacrificial living, dedicated to the greater purpose and a higher calling. I think it looks like a great awakening. It's one, two, a plethora of human beings, fully alive, ablaze by the spirit, igniting all of those around them and stirring up wildfires of worship and glory to God. It's the gospel of Jesus making woke the souls of a comatose people and building a kingdom that is not constrained by skin color or nations. It's the citizens of heaven charging into their destiny. So what's the vision? Jesus is the vision. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, man, I feel like we could just stop there. Wow. We're going to turn the corner here, and like any good conference does, they save the best speaker for the last, right? We did the opposite, you guys. I'm serious, man. I was sitting back there. I just told Joe when she came back there, I was like, I've got to follow that. Like, Wow. But I'm so thankful to get an opportunity to share this afternoon, something that's been on my heart for quite a while, something that I feel like has marked my spirit, if you will. And we're gonna look at how we leave this place and how do we actually run after this awakened life in Jesus. I wanna tell you a story by a man, about a man named Giovanni. Giovanni lived centuries ago. And in his mid-20s in a small Italian town, he began to live a radical life for Jesus. So much so that rumors began to build in the town. Everyone had an idea about why Giovanni was living this way because some people thought he was crazy. He literally sold most of his possessions and gave them to the poor. He went around the, the city every day meeting people's needs, praying for them, interceding for people. Some people thought he was crazy. Some people, they didn't think he was crazy. They just thought he was too intense. He was too extreme. No one in their right mind would really live that way. And still some other people believed that Giovanni was true to his word, that he'd received salvation in Christ and it had marked him in such a way that he was just living his life back for Jesus and that this was reasonable. Bernard of Quintavale, gotta love that name. A businessman in the city 
was so interested in Giovanni's life, he invites him to come stay with him for a few days because he wants to, he wants to get a gaze at his life up close. He wants to see what Giovanni is all about because he recognizes something that Giovanni has that he doesn't have. So he invites him to his house. They sit down the first night. They have a meal together. After the meal, just like you might expect, expect they're sitting there, they're having drinks, whatever, having conversation, and they go back to go to sleep. What Giovanni didn't know is that there's actually a peephole in his room that Bernard expect, or was planning on basically peeping into his devotional life with Jesus. Side note, if you're interested in someone's spiritual growth, don't invite them into your house and, and spy on them, okay? You'll get sent to jail for that stuff today. But this is what Bernard did. And what he noticed was late at night when everyone else would go to bed, Giovanni's knees would find the hardwood floors and he would begin to pray these simple prayers. My God, my all. He could hear it. My God, my all growing with intensity, my God, my all, my God, my all. And Giovanni would weave into praying for people in the city that he had encountered that day or, or interceding for people, but he would come back to that prayer, my God, my all, my God, my all. And over the next few days, Bernard was so moved by Giovanni's personal devotion to Jesus, the way that he loved the people around him, he decided to become his disciple. Bernard sold many of his possessions, and he joined Giovanni in the work of ministry around the city. I tell that story because it actually illustrates one of our primary points of the last two days and of this last session, which is this. God can take a fragmented life made fully alive in Christ, and it brings renewal to the people and the world around us. Here's a more simple way to say it. Corporate renewal begins with personal awakening. Corporate renewal begins with personal awakening. One person becoming awake to all that is theirs in Christ. You might be asking, okay, but why is this important? I actually don't think you're probably asking that because almost every single person who's been up here teaching has talked about the need of the hour. To some degree, the crisis moment we're living in in the Western church and to me, it feels like an alarm is sounding, if you will. The culture is changing so quickly. And of all the things that are changing, to me, there are two things that are changing that I think we really need to pay attention to. Two alarms that are sounding for us to listen to. One is the church is losing a compelling voice in the culture. The church has moved from the center to the margins. It's no longer the place where people are looking for answers and for life. Joe just mentioned this in her teaching. Some data to back this up. The past 20 years have seen an acceleration in the drop-off of Christianity in America with a 20% point decline in the last 20 years. Since the turn of the century, the percentage of U.S. adults with no religious affiliation has more than doubled. It, but it's not just that we're losing our compelling voice. There's actually an entire disenchanted generation. Barna Group has been telling us for years that the young adults living in our country who grew up in the faith, 18 to 29 year olds, 59% of them no longer a part of the faith. Barna recently rele released updated statistics. The dropout problem's not getting better, it's actually getting worse. Young adults growing up in the faith, now it's 64% no longer there. One of the things they did this time though is they actually released four categories that we can categorize all these people who grew up in the faith. This is what they are. Prodigals, people who would say, I was, but I no longer am. 22% of the young people who grew up in the church. Nomads, lapsed Christians, 30%. Habitual churchgoers, this is really interesting, 38%. Listen, you guys, these are people who are saying, I'm still in the pews, if you will. I'm still attending church gatherings, but the teachings, the person of Jesus and the scriptures really have no central place in my life. 38% of young adults who grew up in the church would say that. The encouraging message is 10%. 10% of those young adults, Barna found, they call them resilient disciples. This is young adults who... In, in a changing culture, actually have a red-hot faith for Jesus. I find this encouraging. But all the while, these alarms are sounding, and it feels to me like you and I are standing aboard the, the Titanic. Maybe we're the crew on the Titanic. 
we're receiving signals that we need to look ahead. There could be danger. There could be a crisis ahead. Maybe we need to think about how we're going to re-engage these people who've walked away. How are we going to disciple the next generation? How are we going to take the gospel forward? How are we going to pray differently? One of the saddest things about the story of the Titanic is they actually received warning signs all along and the crew just didn't listen to them. Who's going to take the baton of discipleship in our generation? In my generation, my kids' generation, and say, I want to see more than 10% of them stay in the faith. Heck, I want to see 100% of them and I want to see it multiply. What about the 20% drop in people saying religiously unaffiliated? Do you want to see more of those people say, I found Jesus, I bow the knee to the King? We do, don't we? We have to listen to the warning signs. But if you feel like me, you kind of have this weight and you go, how is my single life going to play a part of this tidal shift that seems, it seems so massive. Can one single life make a difference? I want to switch the narrative on us. I want to, I want to change the question. What if the key question is, what if you don't have to awaken the entire world? You only need to be awakened yourself. The reason I ask this is because when you look in history, we see that God tends to use individuals to renew the larger. So let me just remind us that our God is a God of renewal. I want to read you a passage. This is the ending of our story, Revelation 21, one of the most mesmerizing passages in all of the scripture to me. Listen to the renewal language. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's new. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Notice when John begins to describe what's to be, he begins by pointing out what's not going to be there. What's going to be renewed? This place is going to be different. And verse 5, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. No matter what you carried into this place this weekend, no matter what your circumstances are, this is where God is working all things toward. He will renew all things. He will renew all things. He's the God of renewal. As I mentioned the way that he has most often worked in past. He has a plan. It seems as if there's a pattern, and we've got a slide to illustrate this. God has most often in history chosen individuals that become fully awakened. He does something special in the life of a single person. He, he works deeply in their life, and they have this deep, tangible relationship with him, and that becomes contagious in the way that it spills over to the people they're around. It spills over into their small communities, and then that community catches fire, if you will, and it spills into the next community, and eventually there's a tipping point, and the tipping point is when renewal happens. And we look in church history, that can be geographic locations, sometimes that's tens of thousands of people, sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of people, but God renews. How this typically happens is deep transformation in the hidden places. It's the secret place. A growing sense of God's presence in, one li in one's life and then ministry that emerges out of being with God, not just doing things for him. Mark Sayers He's a, a pastor in Australia. He, he's looked a lot into these type of renewals in history, and he's done his best to take it down to seven steps. And I, I, I share these with you so that maybe you can chart God's activity in your own life. How might he might be wanting to use you for renewal? He says it begins with holy discontent. This is where John began last night. 
To me, this is the only discontent that I'm aware of that isn't sin. Because it shares God's heart. This is the type of discontent that recognizes where I'm at and the world that we're living in and the, living in and the gap between what God has for us. And we want more. Typically, when that discontent wells up inside of us, it leads us to a season of preparation. This is a season of pulling away where God does a deep work in the hearts of the people he wants to utilize, the people he wants to fill with his presence. This preparation leads to contending. Now, this word means it's the art of moving from a life posture of consuming and passivity to one of activity, We begin to pray differently. We begin to engage differently. This contending leads to holy patterns, reorienting one's life around what God's doing in my life and the world around me. These holy patterns often lead to the remnant. A group of individuals being renewed by God come together and they all begin contending together for God's work among them. Eventually, that spills over into renewal. God moves new life. Vitality flows into the person and people of God. And when renewal goes viral, you get revival. I love that. Revival. When renewal goes viral. But still, the question is, how do we get that? How do you and I see ourselves become awakened? and How do we see that spill over? I just want to speak just for a moment on the word awakening. I'm aware that, that there might be some resistance to this word. It's common in the, in the church and in Christian circles that certain words or phrases receive abuse or misuse at times. And that can be any kind of word that's out there. But oftentimes, awakening and renewal have been utilized in that way. So I want to be clear. When we're using the word awakening, this is what I mean. I think this is a biblical view of it. To be in Christ is like someone being adopted into a family. An adopted son or daughter is fully a member of that family, but doesn't yet have a full understanding or operate as they ought to based on what is already his or hers. An adoptive son or daughter often doesn't know how to receive love from his or her mother or father, how to relate to his or her new brothers and sisters. They're unsure about how to utilize the new resources that are theirs in their new family. They're still plagued from bad habits from their birth family or damaged by relationships in the adoptive family. They must learn how to live more and more as members or citizens of their new household. I would argue that in the same way, you and I must do this with our adoptions as sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. We must learn how to receive love. We must learn how to interact with our new brothers and sisters as Joe just taught. We must learn how to utilize our internal inheritance and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. To say it simply, we must awaken all of ourselves to what's now true of us in Christ. We must awaken to the reality that already is. Now I want to show you a, uh, just a little visual up here. These guys are going to bring out a little visual illustration As they're doing that, one of the unique things about awakening is when you are asleep, you don't know anything until you are awake. Think about that, right? You don't know you're asleep until you wake up. And so here, what I've done is we have a bowl of tennis balls. This is going to be just a metaphor for sleepy Christianity. This bowl here, bowl of a cluster of grapes, a metaphor for an awakened, abiding Christianity. And if someone was asleep or maybe had just woken up and you were standing at the back of this room, you could hardly tell the difference here. You would see bowls, you would see green. You wouldn't really know. One of the biggest uh, obstacles in our faith right now in the American church is we're struggling to recognize true biblical Christianity from that which is not. And so sometimes, just like Bernard of Quinta Vale, you have to see something in someone else's life that sparks hunger in you, that wakes you up. It starts creating that discontent. And so let's just play this out for a minute. If, let's start at a high level, piggybacking off of what Joe just shared. A sleepy Christian, how do they relate to the people around them, the people in the community of faith, so to speak? Well, If we were to look at these tennis balls, what would you say about them? 
I look at them and I say, well, they're, they're in close proximity to one another. They're gathered. They're even kind of leaning on one another, if you will. Here's what's unique. If I remove this tennis ball from, from the family, from the group, you and I both know that this tennis ball is gonna remain basically unchanged. I could sit this tennis ball here down, down right here. We could go away for five years and come back and other than dust being collected on the top, it would basically be the same. Why? Because the tennis ball's primary identity is as an individual. It's just a tennis ball. What about the grapes? These grapes are unique because they're interdependent in a different way. You can see it immediately, right? But what's, what's unique is that they are all actually different. I mean, if you can see them, some of you up close, there's different colorations, there's different sizes. If we had a really, if we tasted all of them and you had a really you know, good sense of taste, you could probably taste differences. They're connected both to the vine and to one another. And the biggest difference is if I pluck one off and remove it, what's going to happen? We all know it's going to shrivel and die, isn't it? It's going to wither. That's because this grape's primary identity is not as the grape. Its primary identity is as the cluster of grapes. Very different, the two. A question to ask yourself about your own relationship with other people in the family of God. If you just stopped coming, you stopped showing up to church on Sunday or Saturday night, depending on where you worship at. If you stopped showing up to your small group community, would you change? Would you be fundamentally missing something? Would your life feel like it had a gaping hole in it? Are you dependent on the people you're around in healthy ways that deeply? A deeper question, if you stop showing up, who would have to pray that God would replace you in their life because you're, you're so much helping them grow in their faith? Would there be someone that would say, Lord, they were helping shepherd me, they were helping me mature, they were just encouraging me in my walk with you so much so that now that they're not here, I need you to replace them. You see, these two appear to be the same, but they're fundamentally different. Let's take it one step deeper. How do these two people relate to God? If this bowl over here is God, how are the tennis balls related to it? To some degree, they're connected, right? But primarily, they are compartmentalized. God has this little segment right here that's touching this tennis ball, but, but the rest of the tennis ball is kind of saying off limits to God. Again, they're gathered. This is a picture of Christians who can gather and be a part of God's family and, and show up to events, maybe Bible studies, small groups, but again, remain relatively unchanged. How is it that we can be in the family of God for decades even and remain relatively unchanged? Versus this John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If I remain in you and you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Jesus' prayer, just two chapters later, Father, in the same way that you and I are one, could they be one with us? This is a connected Christian. This is a Christian that experiences communion. They're connected to this vine and they wouldn't even think about trying to live their life apart from the vine. The vine gives all of their sustenance and being and they know they'll shrivel and die without it. The vine connects them to their brothers and sisters in unique ways. Therefore, the grape is constantly growing. It's constantly changing. And you wanna know one of the biggest differences? It gives life to everything around it. Consuming and spectating cultivating life. You see the difference? Interesting thing is, tennis balls always go flat. Grapes give life. Well, I think we need in our generation are, are people who see the difference and are willing, 
are willing to step into the gap with a hunger like John talked about. God, do something. I want a communion. I don't, I don't just want to be connected. I want to know this abiding life as mysterious as it is. And I'm reading, Lord, whatever it means to be in you and you and me, I want that. Would you teach me, Spirit, teach me. Who are, who's going to have that kind of hunger and passion in our generation? Who's going to teach other people to do that? What happens if no one sees other Christians living that way to awaken the world around us? I go back to Giovanni's story. It's interesting. Uh, where I left off, Bernard of Quintavale had sold his possessions, was following after him. In the next year, 11 other men would do the same. In the next decade, over 5,000 people could point to Giovanni's life as significantly marking theirs. Within the next decade, much of Italian Christian history had been formed. You're probably thinking, who was this guy? Why have I never heard of him? It's because Giovanni's his real name. Who you've probably heard of him as is Saint Francis of Assisi. And if you did know him, he's a patron saint of the Christian faith of his day. I only chose his story because I find it personally moving. But I could have chosen hundreds, if not thousands of other stories of God using individual people to awaken other people, the small to the large. And it's all modeled after the life of Jesus, the one man who's ever lived on this earth fully alive, never quenched the spirit, never lived in disobedience, fully alive in who God made him to be poured himself into the 12. Now you and I stand in the wake of that 2,000 plus years later because of an awakened human being. Before Jesus went to be with the Father, he commissioned those disciples to go and make. I just wonder where the heart cry in our generation is to see a change. Lawrence Tribble, on the eve of a great awakening, he wrote this poem. It's a prayer. It goes like this. One man awake awakens another. That man awake goes and awakens his brother. The three men are awake and rouse a whole town by turning the whole place upside down. The many awake can cause such a fuss. It finally awakens the rest of us. One man up with dawn in his eyes, surely then it multiplies. One man up with dawn in his eyes, surely then it multiplies. The question is, who wants dawn in their eyes? Who wants the fullness, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, the fullness of Christ in their life? I want to ask the band to come we're just going to have a time of prayer here. And as we round it out, we talked about how we could end this with energizing stories or a creative element. But we decided just to bring it down to a very non-hype moment. And just ask, what has God been doing in your life over the last two days? And has he been stirring something to you? That maybe it's just the seed of what will be a great awakening in your own life. Has he awakened in your imagination dreams, visions for his kingdom that we need to say yes to? We can only answer that question for ourselves. You can only answer it for yourself. In Jesus' own words, he says, I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. And he's not just talking about the age to come. The abundant life can begin now. And so I want to invite you to bow and we pray. And much like we did earlier, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to risk looking foolish because I believe in this. If you want more of God in your life, if you want to be awake, if you just want to say yes, 
I want to ask you to stand. As a moment for God to mark you and as a moment of community. Jesus, we are yours. The kingdom is ours because you gave your life for us. We couldn't awaken ourselves if we tried. We couldn't awaken the sleeping world if we tried. And we certainly can't make all things new. But that is exactly what you're good at. And so, Lord, in a moment of surrender, we just say yes. Like you said to the church in Ephesus, help us return to our first love, to go back and do the things we once did and recover it. And I pray, Lord, that one man's life, one woman's life would awaken another. I pray for those two to awaken another. I pray for community groups to grow in depth and strength. I pray for it to spill over, Lord, in ways that are unprecedented and not normal around us, God. I pray for the kind of fire that both purifies and also brings new life in our churches. Lord, 13 states represented here. Would you do it in all 13, God? Could the preachers preach? The teachers teach, the artists create. Would your image be displayed in our generation in a way that the onlooking world sees it and wants it? Jesus, would you be magnified among us? We surrender our lives to that. Awaken us in your name for your renown, for such a time as this in our lifetime, we carry the baton for your glory. Amen.